This works, right? Yep. I'm going to hold this so I remember to use it because I can see myself just not even remembering to use it. Grab that clock. I can see this. I can't see that as well. All right. Well, let me open us up with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, even through the words of this catechism. We pray, Lord, that you would enlighten our minds and soften and challenge our hearts to think about the truth of your glory and how you have designed us as bearers of your image to seek you and to glorify you in all that we do. Lord, help us make that not uh, merely an answer to a catechism question, not merely a right answer, but one that causes us to desire you as this answer does speak about, that you and knowing you are eternal life. We thank you for that and we pray for your blessing on this study in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we get started with this study in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, um, There's a lot that can be said about the value of studying catechisms. Uh, We want to get uh, right into this in question one. um, This is, uh, you know, there's there's different catechisms in the Reformed tradition, and this one is in in the English tradition, the English Puritans. In the 1640s, they come up with all the, uh, in the Westminster Assembly, a confession of faith, a larger catechism, a shorter catechism, children's catechism a standard of worship, all these different things. And uh, there's differences between this one and the Heidelberg Catechism, which is uh, older uh, from the Continental Reform tradition. Uh, but uh, I always like this one better because it gets more specific into things like covenant theology. But th- there's, there's positives about both. Uh, but uh, this is the shorter catechism. So the idea is that this is for... Uh, and not for shorter people, but sometimes for, for, for younger people, uh, the answers are shorter, and there's less questions than in the larger catechism. But uh, we can always get into that kind of stuff in the question and answer session. This is question one, and it's a famous question and a famous answer. But what we want to do as we study these things is not merely to memorize things, but we want to understand what these answers mean. We want to understand how the scriptures, the proof texts that the Uh, the architects of this catechism were using, why they went with these answers. Um, You know, proof texts get a bad rap like that. You you bring up these verses, and you look at these verses, you know, those verses don't say that. Well, these verses are like building blocks. They say a part of it, or maybe an implication of the answer. And so we'll see that. And as we go in the weeks, I won't get a chance to maybe quote all the verses or get into them in depth, because oftentimes there's more, a lot more verses than these three. Uh, But we will get a chance to to dive into a little bit of these verses and and why they're relevant here. But question one is, what is the chief end of man? And we'll talk about what chief end means. The answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. His chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so we're going to look at three things in that answer, and I'm just going to reduce them to one word each. First, we'll see design. Second, glory. And third, joy. 
we'll just ask ourselves the question, what are those? And how do they relate to each other? And at the end of it, you know, and, and pardon me, but we'll have to start simple at first. So not to insult anybody's intelligence, but we'll, we'll start simple at first and just to talk about what ends are. But before you know it, we'll be in the deep end of the pool in speaking about how these things go together. These, because we're going to see there's two ends here, God's glory and man's happiness or joy. So let's look at this idea of design or end first. I said we're going to start simple, but um, really we're going to get into great detail here. I, I use an example here of what we're going to mean by design or end or aim or direction or motive. All of those are really going to function as synonyms. So what do we mean by those words? Well, I'm going to use Philippians 2, 10 and 11 as an example of that, and I'm circling the words that are going to point the direction. Uh, often we use the words ends and means. I have an end, that is, I have a goal in my action, but I use means to get there. And another group of words for those is that if I have an end or something I'm trying to accomplish, then that's my ultimate end or my chief end, like this catechism question is talking about. But if you were to take a snapshot of me uh, earlier this week, and you saw me get in my car, you, if you didn't know anything about cars or anything on this planet, if you were an alien from another planet, and you saw me do that, and uh, you might assume that all I was trying to accomplish was to get into that thing, right? But if you knew a little bit, a bit more about cars, you'd know that Nobody just gets into a car. You, you get in it to go somewhere. And so I'm getting in the car as a means of attaining my end of going somewhere. But nobody just goes anywhere. You go to a certain defini- a destination on purpose. So I'm driving my car to go somewhere to get to the store. And you say, okay, that's your end, to get to the store. But nobody just goes to the store, and so you'd realize that to go to the store would be to achieve the greater end of buying some product. You'd say, okay, perfect, that's your end. But nobody just buys something aimlessly. You're a careful shopper. You want to choose this thing over that thing. And you say, okay, the specific product is your chief end. But actually, we can't stop there because the food I buy for nourishment The medicine I buy for bodily health or healing. The office supplies I buy for study. And I won't torture you with going further, but we actually can go further. We don't stop there. There has to be some end for the sake of which I act. And behind that, there is no other. Some chief end that drives all human action. In this passage... Jesus was sent, humbled himself, became obedient even to death, death on the cross. And then so you go through all that stuff that Paul talks about. And then he says, so that, this is all, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that's ultimate. Well, it is more ultimate than anything in this world. But then he says, to the glory of God the Father. And you can see the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, 26 through 28, that Christ is exalted above all things except to the glory of God the Father. Okay, so there you see a subordinate end or a means to achieve an even greater end, a chief end. Uh, an ultimate end among all ultimate ends, the chief end. Okay, so this is really what we're talking about. And in this catechism question, you might um, get the idea that, these, that there's ends that are in competition with each other, that are in conflict. God created the world to glorify himself, and we'll get to that in a second. But is that why we do everything? Because that's not the question. The question is, what is the chief end of man? So is the question asking, why do you get up in the morning? Uh, why do you do all that you do? So this is a very, very practical question. 
it, it's, it's not just about Christian doctrine. This really cuts across Christian apologetics and our conversations with unbelievers. Why are you here? For what purpose is my life? What's the main reason that God put me here? Not the many smaller reasons, um, not the temporary reasons, but is it driving to anything? It, does life have a purpose? So you could see very, very practical stuff. And if the question is, what's man's chief end? And I mean by that, what are you living for? There's a problem with that. Because the Puritans, and forget about the Puritans for a second, Bible-believing Christians everywhere, we shouldn't care merely what happens to float your boat or mine. Because what we're going to see is that we're talking about God's design. We don't just get to self-identify. We don't just get to determine what will make us happy. I mean, if you could believe that, it's very un-American. But I actually don't get to decide what will make me happy. I'm not a self-explaining being. I didn't create my own happiness. I cannot create my own happiness. I cannot make you happy, and you cannot make me happy. So we have to dig deeper here. And one of the attributes of God that we need to consider is the wisdom of God here. Because like human actors, like me going to that store, I think I'm a pretty good shopper, but I'm not perfect. But like human actors, like me or like you, the divine actor has purposes. He has ends. But unlike human actors, the divine actor has infinite wisdom. And so he can have no unwise ends. He couldn't possibly make a mistake in any of the things that he sets out to accomplish. His ends, all of his ends, must be the best ends. And all of the means that he uses, all of those subordinate means, like the cross, like suffering, like things that you and I can't understand why he does what he does with our lives, they must be the most perfectly wise means to that end. Now, quick question here, which is both common sense and very, very deep theologically. But I think we'll all know the answer if we think about it. Before God made anything that he made, so now just picture that if you can, only God exists. Before he made anything he made, what reason did God have? What purpose could God have to make everything, to make anything? And, and here I'm not asking the age-old deep theological question, what, what was his ultimate goal in creation? And although that, that is where we're going, but just stay in the simple end of the pool for this for a second. On a simpler level, if God is God, and he's before all things, and he made all things. And if he creates on purpose, nobody forces him to create. He's free to create or not to create. When God creates all things, from where must he derive his purpose or his end in creating? Can it be, like me as I go to the store, something on the shelf? Or maybe I heard it from a commercial, go get that product. It's outside of you. You want to attain an end. But when God creates the world, not only is there nothing on the shelves, there's no shelves, and there's no commercial, and there's nothing compelling God outside of himself. So for what reason does God create? Is it something outside of himself, or is it something inside of himself? It must be something inside of himself. And at the end of the day, there's really only those two possibilities. There's nothing yet outside of himself. And so God must be his own chief end. So what are we doing here? We're, we're getting beyond the mere Sunday school answer. You ever hear that? The Sunday school answer to everything is Jesus. Like if you don't know the answer and you're a kid, the answer is Jesus. Right, that's the, the evangelical uh, Sunday school answer. We Reformed people have something like that, and sometimes we can maybe rise no higher than that. We can say, the glory of God. That's the Reformed Sunday school answer. But we use that as a cliche. 
We do that. We, you know, this will glorify God in, in my life. And usually there's some completely harebrained thing or sinful thing that we're trying to justify uh, and say, well, this, this will glorify God and so on. And we use that really unthinkingly. What do we mean by the glory of God? Well, that brings up my second point. And I want to look at this in the Hebrew and the Greek just in passing, not very deep word study here, but it is interesting that the Hebrew, uh, the main word that's used for glory, is this word right here, kabod, and it, it comes from another word, sort of an adjective, a kaved, which means heavy, uh, which, you know, you're looking at that on your Hebrew flashcards, and you're like, well, what's the connection? Well, bavink suggests that the connection is a person who is weighty or important. So we use that that word, that this is a weighty subject, or one of C.S. Lewis's essays, The Weight of Glory. Uh, Glory weighs something, in in that sense that an important person, an honorable person, or a very serious, ultimate thing weighs more than a light thing, Um, something like that. Well, there's other words that are used in connection, often together in pairs, especially in the Psalms when words are paired together poetically. Uh, the word beauty is often used, and the word splendor. So, for example, Psalm 29, 2, ascribe to the Lord the glory, kabod, do his name, and, and then it says, worship the Lord in splendor. So, in addition, this concept of glory is not simply weightiness, but radiance, excellence even. The Greek captures the same idea, doxa, from which we get the word doxology, uh, this, this uh, word of praise, and the same things roughly going on with God's own blessedness. So I get that question a lot uh, at Ask Ligonier. I've got it a couple times about when, when people say bless God or I'm going to bless God, and they're trying to be reformed again, they, they say, well, well, I can't bless God. I can't contribute, that's true. God alone blesses and is the fount of all blessing. But Paul says in Ephesians 1, uh, blessed be God the Father. And at eulogia, we get this word and and that form of the word um, for blessedness. Uh, We we have an English word, eulogy, which which is is a good word spoken about someone. And we can say this primarily or in an ultimate way about God. So there's a lot there. It's hard to wrap up in one word or concept, but when you think of glory, think of weightiness, um, blessedness, splendor and beauty, but also uh, the sense in which God excels all other things. Or if you want a real child's version, greatness. The greatness of God. All that God is and how great He is. Um, but there's an initial difficulty, and I kind of hinted at it in that Ephesians 1 passage in that question. Well, we can't, we can't contribute any of this to God, and yet we talk like this. And I, I'm, I'm going to argue rightly so when we say words like glorify God or that God is bringing glory to himself. And, and the dilemma is this, and, and, I'll, and I'll read the verse first. It's one of the three verses that they use. It's 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to, now that we're pointing this way now, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. So that if I'm doing something as seemingly insignificant as drinking coffee, I do that in a way that is to the glory of God. That's what Paul's indicating, that you, are, that you ought to glorify God in all that you do. And everybody says, amen, we want to do that. Now, what do we mean by that? Um, Because, here's the the dilemma. If God is truly self-sufficient, and I added another attribute up there, immutable, he never changes. So, what sense does it make to talk about glorifying God? So, I'm radiating to God, I'm drawing attention. I'm, it's another word we use is fame, his fame spreading, so I'm making him famous. Um, how does that, doesn't that suggest that I'm contributing something to him? Well, that is a very understandable first impression, but 
let me introduce an idea that if you're not familiar with it yet, a distinction that will help us here uh, resolve this. And that is a distinction between the intrinsic glory of God versus the extrinsic glory of God. Now, in anything, when we talk about God, we are speaking analogically. That's all we can do as humans. We're limited by human speech. We're limited by finite categories. And God is, by definition, infinite. And so when we speak about any attribute of God, we're really dealing with this. The intrinsic glory of God is that glory of God which he has in himself. This is divine glory, properly speaking. This is that glory that cannot be added to, that glory that cannot be subtracted from. And so that's what we have in our minds, and we're like, wait, 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 that can't be added to, and that's right, it can't. Here, we're speaking even more analogically. We're speaking about, this is a manner of speaking, to speak about God's greatness going public. His greatness communicated to the creature, the creature conforming to that greatness. So in Psalm 29, to ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. That glory is already his. We're now ascribing, reckoning, or conforming to what actually is in God. So that makes no difference to God, but it makes a great difference to the creature. Okay, so that's one way to understand how to resolve those things. But when we look throughout the scriptures, we do see that his glory is something that he puts above everything else. And if we want to understand the chief end of man, we have to understand this chief end of God. Psalm 138 verse 2 says it in this way, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And that's another way of saying that he has put his glory above everything. Psalm 8 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Or in Isaiah 6, you remember that the glory of the Lord not only filled the the temple, but the whole earth is full of his glory. Now, he says this about everything. Take, for example, his redeeming of Israel from their sin in Isaiah 48, verse 11. He says, for my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. So, good news, he is saving you because his glory is at stake. That's, that's great news. God puts himself first, and that is great news if we're being saved, because that's why he does it. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7, this is his reason for creating human beings. At the very end, when he redeems and he collects to himself all of his people, he says in Isaiah 43, verse 6, I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So, why does God do anything that he does for his glory? And there's a million reasons within that. But this is his chief reason that explains all the others. God's chief end is what determines man's chief end. Again, we don't get to decide our chief end. The Bible calls human beings a God-made being, a God-determined being, a God-glorifying being. And so God will have his glory in the end from every single human being. Uh, The only question remaining for human beings, this is not like, um, you know, all rivers lead to the same ocean. Well, there's a sense in which that's true, but that's that's not universalism. That's judgment day. And so there's a separation there. When we are all brought back to God, yes, God will be glorified in the lives of every single human being, but it'll make a tremendous difference to one side or the other. Will you be glorifying God in his justice? Or will you be glorifying God in his mercy? Will it be willingly an inconceivable joy? Or will one be among those whose knee will bow and whose tongues will confess Christ as Lord under the greatest of all regrets and under the greatest of terrors? Now, we move to that 
other end. Because in the question, it seems to suggest at first maybe that he's asking about, well, what's, what's your view of life? Why are you here? Uh, but what we want to do is actually bring those together, to bring that under the subordination of God's chief end. Okay, so let's talk about joy. This makes Reformed people a little uncomfortable sometimes, too, when they're trying to protect God's glory, as we should. But God made us as happiness-seeking beings. We do that terribly, and that's our problem. But the fact of the matter is that God designed us to be happiness-seeking beings. Even question 21 of the children's catechism testifies to this. In what condition did God make Adam and Eve? He made them holy and happy. I want to stop reform people at that point when they're reading this to their kids and say, stop right there. Do you believe this? Yeah, holy and, and happy. Oh, okay, I know where you're going, but it's, the happiness has to be determined by the holiness. Absolutely. It, but is that your way of throwing away the happiness? Some people even do this by saying, well, happiness is different from joy. Well, in the fall, certainly, and, and there's distinctions to be made. But I, I still hear in that reservation this uncomfortableness with happiness. And uh, we can get a bad rap for that because we really haven't wrapped our own minds around what happiness is in God's creation, in his original design. And somebody could say to this, well, okay, but supposing we had to choose one or the other, holiness or happiness, I, I want to break in and say, well, why, why are you doing that? Why are you choosing one or the other? And the answer, of course, will be, well, sin. Sin is why we must choose between them, because sin has spoiled our joy. Sin has distorted our definition of happiness. I agree. Sin has done this. However, there's two things worth thinking about, which I hope will prevent us from just leaving things at that. Uh, the first of those things, we have to look at God's design, and I have here a little chart. There's something called the four states of man. Uh, I'm just going to put three, and the third and the fourth are going to kind of go together because God is redeeming us and restoring. So just keep things simple at first. Beginning, the bad, and then the happy ending. So let's just keep it simple right there. Creation, fall, redemption. And you can see here, not simply that man's joy points to God's glory in God's original intention, but that this lens, man's joy is a subordinate end or the means God is using to glorify himself. What are we called in Genesis 1, 26 and 27? Images of God. What's that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but one of the things it surely means is that man was created a little bit like God in the sense of having mind and feeling and will, and unlike or greater than all the other things in creation, we can think about God. We can feel feelings about God. We can do things in conforming our lives to God. And when we do that a certain way, we bring God more glory than if we don't or if we do so begrudgingly. Do you think kids are good kids if they say to their parents about cleaning their room? Uh, fine. Okay. Just like if, if we say we're sorry for something. Fine. Sorry. Or do we honor the person more if we do it joyfully? The Proverbs talk about that, about a, a son that makes their parents glad and so forth. Okay, so in the fall, yes, man's happiness, he's seeking for joy. He's seeking for permanence. He's seeking for meaning in all the wrong places. It's like a chicken with his head cut off ever since Adam and Eve sinned, and they're now seeking glory in lesser things. The problem is not seeking happiness. Romans 2.7 says, but to the one who seeks for glory. That's one of the things Paul lists there as someone who will have eternal life. And so the problem is sin, absolutely. But we want to say with the psalmist in Psalm 86, 11, Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. My thinking, my feeling, and my doing all put back together again. So we have to look at God's design in its ongoing objective sense. And we also have to see, as the last picture shows, we also have to see how God is, in Christ, putting that back together again. 
God is redeeming our pleasure-seeking. God is redeeming our self-preservation even. When Jesus uh, calls people in the gospel, he, he basically appeals to your desire to live. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul, right? Mark 8, 36. And so he, what is he doing? He's appealing to our sense of desire. Even the calls to hate your own life in Luke 14 and elsewhere. In John 12, in that version, in John 12, 25, whoever hates his life in this world will find it. So is he killing happiness in the gospel? Is he leaving it neutral? Or is he redeeming happiness and pointing it back to its true end? A couple of quotes for you to, to end here. We'll just end in the deep end of the pool just to get you to think about this. Pascal, uh, the French philosopher, he's a Christian, he said this about the end of happiness. Consider these words. He said, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will, substitute the word, the image of God never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action, of every man, even of those who hang themselves. But can't you... Can't you be motivated by something less than happiness as that last extreme example? No, because even there, there's the end of relinquishing pain, which you would not do if you did not desire your better. What Pascal is saying is that it's actually psychologically impossible for a being such as the image of God is to do anything except for one's own good. Now, sin has terribly distorted that. Nevertheless, that is what wires us. Jonathan Edwards said it in many ways, but here's one of the ways he said in his book of the end for which God created the world, he reflected on the glory of God and the enjoyment of man coming together as one. And here's where I really wanted to drive to. Here, here's how he puts it. God is glorified not only by his glories being seen, but by its being rejoiced in. When those that see it delight in it, God is more glorified than if they only see it. God made the world that he might communicate and the creature receive his glory, both with the mind and the heart. He that testifies his having an idea of God's glory does not glorify God so much as he that testifies also his approbation of it. In other words, his heartfelt commendation or praise of it and his delight in it. Now go to those examples of the child cleaning the room begrudgingly or saying, I'm sorry, begrudgingly. What Edwards is saying is that the lens called God's image shows more of the greatness of God if I not only open up my Bible and say, taste and see that the Lord is good, okay, versus if I taste and see that the Lord is good, and I convince you of that with my money, with my music, with my love for others, with my praise, what I tend to talk about and obsess about versus other things, I will glorify God more if I make much of him, if I talk about his greatness as if I am persuaded that he is, in fact, that great. So that's what Edwards is saying. Now, I bring this up for a lot of reasons that we can get into in the Q&A time, but these ends go together. God's glory as the chief end God has made the world in a way to make that hinge on man's pursuit of him. And so Psalm 73, we'll close with this verse, is one of the verses they use. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. 
My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That last part especially is crucial. God is the strength of my heart. In other words, he's my passion. He's my fixation. He's my treasure. That's the last words, my portion forever, meaning God is my treasure. And so that's going to affect how I live my life here. That's going to affect everything that I do here if I'm really persuaded that if I have nothing else, then I have Jesus Christ and I have him forever. So we have no need to fear that human happiness may be defined in the end against God's glory. I say in the end because I'm fully aware that it does so now because of sin. But even now there is a renewal of ends in that whole course of God renewing his image. And there has to be because if there wasn't, God would be making for himself a new creation which honors him dispassionately, that honors him simply because we have to. But we know that God is far too serious about his glory to do that. So let me open it up to questions, and then we'll pray after we take some Q&A. And if not, I'll mention that thing I was going to mention <laughs> about those two ends going together, because there is some controversy about this. Yeah. I've got a cat, and um, now that she's the only cat, she's being a little more responsive. <laughs> right, right. But I kind of think of it, you know, that just kind of helped me understand mm. that better. Because God creates things that you say, why did he, this happen, you know? And we have that freedom of choice. Mm. But it honors him if our freedom of choice is to honor him. Yeah. And, um, you know, later on I was thinking, too, you know, like on the point about the joy, uh, you know, at one point Paul says, I've been, in, I've had, um, not wealth, but, you know, he was, he's done well, he's right. been poor, mm -hmm. he's learned to be satisfied. Yeah. And satisfied is what is sticking with me as yeah. the peace that then brings you that joy. Yeah, and this is not a flippant or a, or a shallow view of joy because you brought up Philippians and I immediately thought of a Puritan work by Jeremiah Burroughs called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. It's one of the most underrated books of all time. Everybody should read it. He winds up speaking in that, especially if you're not used to the Puritans, he, he winds up speaking almost 90% about suffering and hard things and how God does not need you and this world would get on without you. And all these different things, and you're like, ugh, and he's just like these punches to the gut. But he's arguing, for, he's dusting everything in this world away from your highest conceivable joy, which is God. So, you know, Paul in Philippians 4, he has that secret of contentment. And that's the secret, is that he has, um, he has this joy that nothing in this world can possibly parallel. And so if he did lose everything else, he would actually have everything else and more in the, in the renewed creation. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, and the one on the on the, the third one, yeah. Is the image completely lost at the fall or partially lost? Right, um, I would say partially lost. And it depends what question people are asking. Um, you brought up the will and freedom. Um, by the misuse of Adam's free will, he lost 
the soundness of that will. The way Calvin said it once, we don't deny the freedom of the will. We, what we deny is its soundness. What he meant is, I mean, people say that about Calvinists. Uh, you don't believe in free will. And I always try to answer it a different way just to make them think. I'll say, no, we believe you can choose freely. You can sin at McDonald's or Burger King. Um, what you can't do is spiritually raise yourself to life or produce the righteousness that God requires, nor would you want to. You have a moral inability. Your whole will is, is in bondage to sin. So if the question of is the whole um, uh, image lost, the question can uh, fix on the will or it can be, uh, there, you know, within the Reformed even, there, there's been a debate at least in the last hundred years about um, whether the mind is, uh, is subject to the fall. Everything's subject to the fall. Um, that that debate is kind of a, a misnomer there, but um, so the so the whole image is under bondage to sin. Yet the image is retained, and I would say Genesis nine five and six and Psalm eight are two good places to start, because there at least you would see that the dignity of the image of God is intact, because we're supposed to uh, defend and respect and protect life because it's made in the image of God after the fall. That's Genesis 9, 5, and 6. And then Genesis, sorry, Psalm 8, dominion is still a mandate after the fall because Psalm 8, now that's being restored too because Hebrews 2 tells you that Psalm 8 is ultimately pointing to Christ, that he's ultimately has Christ to be the one who achieves this dominion. Um, but that's rooted in the image of God um, in Psalm 8 because that was one of the, the aspects of the image of God in Genesis 1, 28. So there's a long way to say, um, yes, the image of God still retained, um, but the totality of the image is under sin until we're regenerated. So, uh, and obviously that brokenness and the effects of it is still there after we're regenerated. There's that whole fourfold states of man thing where we now in Christ have the ability to obey, but also to sin. So we still sin. There's a lot more to that. <laughs> the immaterial part is usually cited as what is missing now mm. uh, from the fall. Right. So the connection with holiness, righteousness, yeah. uh, the ability to uh, have fellowship with God is broken. Yes, yes. Yeah, definitely. And we'll, once, Lord willing, once we get there, we'll be able to see when they start talking about uh, that bondage to sin and regeneration and all that. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. This is for in the morning group. Is there anything wrong or lacking? Would you paraphrase this? I'm thinking particularly of witness. Uh, the first question to uh, what is the chief end of man versus what is the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. Which is a common Yeah. Paraphrase. One of the reasons I want to link this question to that, even when the unbeliever says it wrong, and the unbeliever is always going to say it wrong, and frankly, a lot of believers will follow the culture in saying that wrong. One of the reasons I want to link it is not to make them equivalent to each other, but to use it as a, as a net and say, actually, this is, a, this, is, this is the right way to mean that. I, I want to say to unbelievers, you don't, you don't really mean that. You're not serious enough about your happiness. Um, or... Uh, Francis Schaeffer would say like this kind of, um, you don't know who you are. We know who you are. You're an image of God. And so um, I want to take that opportunity not, not to correct them with a, with a hammer, but I, but I do want to correct them and say, that's a good question. What is the meaning of life? Um, well, what do you mean by it? <laughs> and to start challenging them and to make them think, you actually can't mean anything by that if you cut yourself off from God. Because meaning means what the meaner means. And if there's no meaner, then you don't mean anything. You may think you mean something, but you don't, because you weren't there to create yourself when you were born. What kind of a being did you make of yourself? And of course, they'll, under the effects of existentialism in all modern culture and postmodern culture, well, we make that up as we go along. Right, how, how's that working out for you? Um, the Dr. Phil question. Uh, how's that working out for you? Um, so, I think those are the ways to, to use this uh, apologetically, is to uh, use it as a net of correction and, um, and realize that we do mean something different. Always be aware ourselves that we don't get caught up in the world's definition 
of uh, what life's purpose is and so on. Yeah. But it's very satisfying. I think the Christian needs to know that, that they all have a purpose. Yeah. I think a lot of Christians, unfortunately, sometimes can feel truths like this are suffocating. It's all about God's glory and all these different things. But actually, that chief end is infinite in its resources and so begins to explain the diversity of ends and callings that God gives us. And there's many ways in which people struggle with this, whether it's gifts in the church or whether it's male and female or all these different things. And you get the Bible answer and you're like, yeah, that's just so patronizing. But actually, it's much more liberating because this chief end, our problem is we've only scratched the surface of it. We've not seen all the different ways that the way God designed me and the way that God placed me in this world and the people he put into my life, I've only just scratched the surface in how this will glorify God. There's infinite resources there versus if I try to write the story. At first, and by the way, that's the devil's lie to Adam and Eve, essentially. You can write your own story. Eventually, my resources run out. I can't even think of what to write after the first couple pages. And every time I do start to write my own story, it crashes and burns. And so it's because there's, there's, there's a, a very limited amount of resources there that's corrupting. Um, so that, that's another way to to think about that. All right. Well, let me uh, close us in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this great subject, this weighty subject of your glory through even our lives and the capacities that you've given us for happiness, which is to be found only in you. We do pray that you would forgive us for the many ways, even as believers, that we sink back into attempting to author our own purpose. We thank you for this infinite um, treasure of your purpose in your own glory. Teach us today and all that we experience in the worship service to discover more ways in which your glory is satisfying to us and that our satisfaction in you will bring you glory. We thank you for this. We pray that you would write this word from your word upon our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.